Sorry. On today's episode, we are joined with three-time Gold Glover, two-time All-Star, former Detroit Tigers, spent a total of 16 years in the big leads, Mr. Plasto Blanco. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Hey, thank you for having me, guys. Appreciate it. So for those who want to know, what's Plasto up to nowadays? Where I'm uh, playing a lot of golf and uh, working, I'm working with the Dodgers as a um, uh, special assistant to the player development. You're a good golfer? I'm okay. I'm like a five-handed capper now. Oh, okay. That's, that's, <laughs> that's not, okay. Yeah. That's pretty. That's pretty good. I'm a go- we're golfers too. You know, we golf a lot. Oh, like, really? Yeah, on the weekends. Yeah, I'm like stuff. an 18 plus handicap. So, <laughs> so do you? Well, golf- you probably don't practice. You probably don't practice enough. So you know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah, you got to practice like every sport. I would think you somebody like you would have less time to get on the course than I would, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Uh, do you ever golf with any like the players at all? Is it just like when you're in season, there's no golf? Uh, no, because um, like my schedule is very flexible, and uh, like we either practice in the morning or in the afternoon. And if I'm in Arizona and we practice in the afternoon, then I play golf in the morning. Gotcha. Or you know, and then when I'm in Miami, I play with my friends here. You know. Oh yeah. I so play with Pudge. I play. I play with Pudge. Oh Pudge. Okay. How's yeah. Pudge? How's Pudge? How's Pudge? He's, he's, he's really good. He's really good. Okay. Yeah, actually, it's probably like a four handicap. I think. Ah, jeez, God, you guys are so good. Yeah, the baseball swing doesn't translate to the golf swing. Is that false? Well, we don't mess with baseball anymore. We don't swing the bat. Oh yeah, so we just swing golf clubs. <laughs> <laughs> the same, same. When I play baseball, I never play golf, just in case. Right, right, right. <laughs> Say it on golf, real quick, because I'm a golfer. I play one year, like a little small college golf. You know, we we do a lot of that. So, what kind of clubs you got? I'm just curious. Like, what kind of which which you work with? Mizunos. Oh, oh so he's got, yeah, you, you got, got the good stuff. Yeah, 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 you got the good yeah. stuff. Yep, that's a five handicap golfer right there. The forge, <laughs> yeah, forge. Forge, yep, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. All right, so I want to just talk about you and your career and all that stuff. I mean, obviously, you played a ton of years in the big leagues, obviously, as we talked about. And, of course, our home team, our boys, Detroit Tigers, fantastic career. I just want to kick it off with – do you miss the city at all? Do you miss being like in Detroit? I know you said you do some stuff here in the city still, but thoughts on that? I do miss Detroit a lot. You know what? I played 16 years and Michigan was the only place where I bought a house. Mm. So I had a house not far from Birmingham, like in the Troy area, you know, and uh, I miss it. I mean, that was my house there. I lived there for a little bit, you know, and I uh, miss going to the ballpark and people were super nice, fans, like everywhere I went restaurants they gave me a very nice welcome and uh i mean it's just a great place to play you know and not to mention you know we had good years there too you you played with a lot of good people here in detroit do you have a favorite player a favorite teammate of yours from the tigers wow that's a tough question because we had um like that 2006 year we had a bunch of i mean a lot of nice guys like look at ramon santiago which is coaching for them now i mean what a great guy you cannot you know, beat that. But well, I play with Sean Casey, Curtis Granderson, Craig Monroe. I mean, that's like those were. I'm talking about Class A teammates. Well, there, you you, you know, mentioned uh, you mentioned 2006, and I want to ask you. So in 2005, with, under Alan Trammell, you guys finished fourth in your division. Then Leland comes in the next year, and all of a sudden you guys are World Series contenders. What is it that changed when he came in to to manage the team for you guys? Well, I remember, I mean, we had um, a bunch of uh, younger guys, you know, that were tr- still learning the game. And then when Jim Leland came, um, a, we had a good mix of guys there. You know, we had now Fernando Rodney there, you know, with uh, his second, second year, maybe Verlander, Bonderman. And when you have that type of talent, that helps too, you know. I mean, you have guys, their second year in the league now, they know what what to do, and uh, you have a, a a bunch of veteran guys like myself that I I was already maybe I don't know seven eight years in the league already, and then uh, Maglio, Carlos, Poch. So that's a pretty good combination there, you know, yeah. of uh, veteran and 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 the energy, the energy. I think the energy that that we had, um, Jim Leland like made sure that that everybody was pulling one direction. And, and that was the key right there. You know, it was rooting in for, for everybody on the team. And uh, he just, the things that he said on, uh, on interviews after games and before the games, like 
as a player, you 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 to say like, oh man, this guy got my back, you know, like right. let's we gotta do this, and 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 Jim Leland is the type of guy. Maybe you guys don't know this, but um, let's say we had a seven o'clock game at four o'clock. He was ready to play, like he was playing. He 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 managed with spikes on. He he managed with spikes on. That's all skip. That. Spikes. Yeah, put spikes. And then when you as a player, you see a guy like that at four o'clock. You say, "Man, this is the manager's ready. We better be ready." You know. And those are the type of messages that he would send like that. You know, if you were paying attention, uh, you get it. <laughs> So was there any, like, I know you kind of just dove into some Jim Leland stuff, but is there a story that sticks to you particularly, like, over your years of being with the Tigers? It could be anything. It could be, like, good, bad, funny with Jim Leland. Old Skip. Well, about Jim Leland? Yeah, just Jim Leland. Oh, there's, 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 a, there's a bunch of things that are, like, <laughs> you, know, you, you, know, you, you, you know how he likes to smoke, right? Yeah. He likes to smoke. We like to smoke. And one time we put a smoke detector on the, in the dugout, and then <laughs> that thing went off. And he went like, God damn, what the fuck? <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's like really crazy. It's like really, it was, and we were laughing like crazy. <laughs> oh my God. Is there a mastermind behind those kind of pranks that you guys did with the Tigers? I'm, I'm pretty sure it was uh, Jeremy Bunderman that did that. That. Like <laughs> that, that. that team, you know, the Tigers, I don't know if you know or not, but the Detroit teams have been going through a little bit of slump over the years. We're trying to come up. And just for us to sit here and reflect and think about all those players and like situations like that, it's great. And it's like, how do we, you know, we always talk about how do we get back to that point as being a, a, a 2006 team or a 2012 team? And I think it starts with the culture. And it's that culture, I think, that Jim Leland had built, which I think is so phenomenal, you know? So, yeah, it seems like you guys had a great rapport yeah. with your team. You guys all seemed like you guys were not but, only teammates, but friends. And, and exactly. I feel like that's so important. And you guys really hit home on that. Uh, chemistry plays a big role. Yeah, yeah. When you have everybody together, and, uh, and that's something that we had there. And not to mention the talent, you know. And everybody went out there. And 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 another thing, every time we went out there, it's like we had a legit chance to win because I mean, look at our um, pitchers, the pitchers that we had. You know, the starting rotation was phenomenal, crazy. And then if we were winning in the seventh, that that's it because it was tough on the other team because we had Fernando Rodney, uh, Joel Sumaya. And uh, the closer, uh, uh, Todd Jones, to close oh, the game. Yeah. Oh, that's it, Jones. that's it. Yeah, so th th that's it. You know, seven, eight, nine, that's it, you, you know? Yeah. So I, uh, I, I want to take you back to just a, uh, a particular situation or day, October 14th, 2006. It's an iconic mm -hmm. moment. You know, we, we have pictures everywhere of you on first base, right? Magley up to bat. And hey. just like... I know you tell that story probably a million times, but like, how, <laughs> how does that, how does that still affect you this day? Like, what are your thoughts on it? Well, I was just begging for Maglio to hit a base hit. Cause yeah. uh, if, I don't know, uh, I think Craig Monroe was on first base, right? On second yeah. base. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah, I'm second. not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, 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 and I was on first base and yep. I'm like, I was just begging for a hit. A hit would have done it. But right. This guy hits a home run and I didn't know what to do. So I just started jumping instead of running and jumping like a little kid. And I'm happy. And I'm like, oh, my God, we're just going to World Series. It's just probably one of the happiest moments in my, in my career. You won yeah. the, uh, the MVP for the ALCS, right? And yes, in 2006. In 2006. Yeah. Let me ask you this. So Rod mentioned it earlier. So you have three gold gloves, a silver slugger, and the ALCS MVP. Now let's have a little fun with this, okay? You gotta give one back. Which one's it gonna be? Mm, this is a good one. You gotta give if one I gotta, gotta give one back. You gotta give one back, and, and like as a whole. So if you pick the golden gloves, all the golden gloves are gone. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, you gotta put them all together. I was gonna give one gold glove away. <laughs> yeah, you, got, you, got a, you got a few to spare. Yeah. <laughs> I probably, I probably, uh. Give back the the silver slugger. Oh yeah. Okay. Ah, okay. Ooh. Yeah. Slugger. Be because because I take a lot of pride in defense, and I know you can win a lot of game by, by a lot of games by playing good defense. Yeah. So yeah, showed in your yeah. showed in your game. Yeah. And not only mm -hmm. just defense, but at the play, you're you're at, you're at bat presence. You know, when I was growing up, when I was a little kid, my dad used to tell me WWPD. What would Polanco do? Literally, I would, <laughs> I would have an O2 count at the bat, uh, up to bat. And I would be like, all right, choke up on the bat, you know, and just put the ball in place somewhere. And that's what you did. And I think that was, was great. What was your mentality when you were up to bat? You know, you had those, those counts, O2, down the count, just as a batter in general. Well, first of all, never panic, you know. And um, 
just let the ball travel a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Try to hit it like to first base. And when you think that doesn't mean you're going to hit it that way all the time, but when you think that way, you let the ball travel and you give yourself more time to recognize the curveball, the change ups, you know. But when you let the ball travel, you have to think fastball at the same time. Because you, if you let the ball travel and you think something off, then any fastball is going to be by you. So mm -hmm. if you look for fastball middle away, then you're ready for, for anything else. And that was my approach probably my whole life. Now, early in the count, if I was ahead in the count, then I move my, my thoughts maybe more up the middle and try to hit a gap or something. It really was phenomenal. Like you knew, like we knew as Detroit fans, if Polanco had two strikes, he wasn't. Get, he was putting the ball in play somewhere. Player and player getting on. <laughs> yeah, that was just, that was the coolest part about it. Like you know, you got like the power hitters, you know, they'll strike out, you know, because they're trying to hit a home run. But it's like you, you were just trying to put the ball in play, and that was the coolest part about it. You know? and, and something that is undermined is the fact that that's such a good teammate to have on a team, right? A team can have the power hitters, but. A guy like yourself who would come up to the plate and you knew there was a damn good chance you were getting on the bag, that's awesome to have. And that, that's so important for a team. So I can see why you were part of so many successful teams. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you got to have, I think, uh, so sometimes you have a lot of good names on, on a team, you know, a lot of good players, of but that doesn't necessarily make you a good team. So you got to have maybe a little bit of everything, you know, a nice combination there, like a uh, good catcher, look good shortstop, good center fielder, obviously, right. obviously the pitching, people that get on base, you know. If you have a lot of power hitters, like either you're going to win by a lot or you're going to lose by a lot. And you're exactly. Gonna, well, so. staying, on, staying on names, I don't, I'm sure you know by now, but our guy from Detroit, Miguel Cabrera, is approaching a very historic milestone of 500 home runs, 3,000 hits. Have you had any past conversations with him or have you had any type of interactions with him? And what are your thoughts on him and his milestone he's approaching? I, I, it doesn't surprise me at all. I play with Miggy and I play with a lot of good hitters. And he's probably, if not the best, one of the best that I play with. And i um, super proud of him. You know, he's extremely talented and wish him nothing but the best. And we do talk, you know, every once in a while. And, um, but, you know, he's traveling a lot. I'm also right. traveling. But, uh, but it, what, what a great guy. What a great teammate. You know, that's another great teammate that I had there. We got along great. It's just fun to be always a guy joking around, you know, keeps yeah. the clubhouse loose, which is important. So, and uh, again, I couldn't be more proud of him. And I uh, hope he plays, you know, like maybe, I don't know, a few more years and, oh, and, I keep, raking so. and, keep, and keep and keep raking. Yeah. He, he can flat out hit. <laughs> he can hit. Yes, he can. Yeah. Yeah. So, Placido, you are from the Dominican. And yes, sir. I, I have a, th a theory that people here in America um, have a hard time putting in perspective of coming from other places and the opportunity that's given here in America. I, th I feel like a lot of Americans take that for granted. So I, I want to ask you, growing up in the Dominican, what's it like to be a baseball player? Are, do people over there feel that there's an opportunity to become a professional or do you have to be that much better than somebody here, let's say in America, who can have opportunity in college and, and move on in their career uh, in stages. But for you, at what point did you realize, okay, I'm good enough to maybe take this to the next, next level, move on a little bit, or uh, things like that? Well, in the Dominican Republic, we live and die baseball, you know, and we don't have like that many sports. Uh, well, nowadays, we have a few basketball players in the NBA, but back in the days, it was just baseball, baseball, and baseball. We don't have football. We don't have soccer or none of that. And uh, having a lot of uh, Dominican players, you know, that's something that we like, oh, you know, I, when you're a kid, your dad puts you in a little league and then you start playing baseball there, T-ball, whatever. And you just do it for fun. And, you know, it's a, a sport. Then in my case, uh, like I didn't know you get paid. <laughs> for just playing baseball. I didn't know until like I, like I was 14. When I was 14, that's when I found out like, oh, you really get paid when, you know, for doing this because for me, it was a game. Right. You know, like, how, how do you get paid for playing a game? You know, and, and, and nothing. I was like at 14, I was playing with uh, older kids, you know, 16, 17. And then I was able to get a scholarship to come to, to Miami-Dade. And But right before that, right before that, the Hiroshima Toyo Carp, a team from Japan, wanted to sign me. 
you know, to mm. play professional ball for them. And that's when I, well, maybe I have talent, you know, maybe I'm good enough to obviously play professional and maybe make a career out of this. But then my dad and I decided to, my parents and I decided to maybe come to the United States, you know, um, study here and, and play baseball in junior college. And that's what happened. I got drafted my first year by the White Sox and then the, um, by St. Louis Cardinals my second year. And that's when I signed and went ahead and started playing. But it wasn't until like I was maybe 14 or 15 when I uh, said like, well, I really have a, a chance at this, you know. Plus, I really love, I love the game. I love the game. And this is something that I really, I'm still in the game. I'm still in the business. And something that, uh, wow, <laughs> if, I, if I live again, and I'll do it again. You know, if I die and I, <laughs> if That's I'm awesome. born again, I'll do it again. <laughs> and it's something about baseball too, you know, the longevity of it. You know, you see these other sports, you know, football and, you know, these like physical sometimes hockey too. It takes like, you know, some people just don't even want to be involved with the sport after they're done, you know, cause it just took, it just took such a big toll on their body and their mental health. But it's like baseball, you know, I just feel like everybody wants to still be a part of it because it's just that game that is just, it's just so good. It's just so good. And it brings you back because it's just that good. And I feel like that's, you know, that's, you know, you find yourself on the Dodgers now. And I kind of want to talk about that too. You know, do you have any, you know, uh, maybe, future goals in mind of maybe managing a team one day like maybe like hey i want to be a manager of a team i don't i don't count that out because um a lot of people ask me that question and i think i have the personality i have the knowledge and and obviously i played in the big leagues for a long time but uh, but um a, the other day one of our managers in one of the high a ball uh, the class a club uh, had to do something and they called me to manage the, the, the team for four days and and I, I'm like, wow, maybe, you know, maybe I like this. When I went ahead and I did it, all the players were, like, really happy. And we won, like, three out of four. And I really liked that experience. You know, it's right. something good. And so that's why I don't really count it out. And um, maybe in the future, you know, my, I have a 17-year-old boy. And once maybe when, once he starts college now, I probably go ahead and do it maybe like full time because you know if you want to manage that's a full time job. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so what what I have now is kind of a, uh, it's a full time job but it's more flexible. You know I'm more traveling here and there and I spend some time at home. But um, I, I I well that experience I really like and I don't count it out. I think I I have the personality. I will something that I would love to do and uh, it's something that um when you have people like maybe Tony La Russa, I'm Jalen Lee, I'm telling you that that I be a good manager then then you know that's coming from them it really means a lot to me and yeah. and that is something I, that yeah, you start that, putting thoughts in here <laughs> those are some pretty big elites in the managing field you know they're giving you the yeah. jack yeah you're good <laughs> you yeah. got the job <laughs> they're giving you the way yeah. you're good to go yeah. so uh Placido, you mentioned your son and i just want to say um your son might have like the coolest godfather of all time albert pool <laughs> that's like <laughs> I love my godparents. <laughs> but, but let me just say, that is the coolest flex. You can say, yeah, my godfather's Albert Pools. What does yours do? <laughs> I know. I about. Yeah. Is that a family thing? Were you guys friends before baseball, or did you guys become such good friends during playing together? No, playing together because Albert, uh, I was already in the major leagues when Albert got invited to spring training with us, St. Louis. And uh, I told him to stay with me in the house, you know, like come over here and save your meal money and save your hotel, or whatever. And he stayed with me for that spring training and that spring training, he made the team. And then I told him where to live in St. Louis and best friend, we'll go to the ballpark together and do a lot of stuff together. I kind of took him under my wing and told him, you know, the, and, and we've been like best friends uh, ever since. And then when my son was born, he baptized him and, and we've been like best friends ever since we talk. Yeah. And that's one guy that I talk to every day. Yeah, he's a he's a he's a dog. He's a dog. I just feel like that. You know, when I think of two elite hitters, elite players in the MLB, Albert Pujols and Miguel Cabrera, my two favorite players ever. I wanted to ask you uh, how much of you, aside from you. <laughs> aside from how, you, how much of you impacted him coming to LA. Uh, probably not, not, not much. I told, I told him how good of a club we are, you know, the, the chemistry and all that. And, uh, but uh, to be honest, it was more his agent than himself. So, you know, but, um, he lives very close by, he doesn't live far from, you know, like Anaheim, which is like, I don't know, half hour maybe, 
but um that's a decision that he made no 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 me but i did tell him that 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 you know he'll be a good good help for us his presence in the clubhouse and maybe playing against lefties and and Pujols is really happy with us and he's doing outstanding we love him here and uncle albert <laughs> uncle <laughs> albert El <Elk> Al. <laughs> yeah yeah, he's doing, he's doing, he's doing really good. He's doing, yeah. That's you know what, people, people, have. people. You know what's impressive? You know the the type of player he is. He's a better person than he is a player. Mm, that means a lot. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's yeah. that's that's huge because I mean, <laughs> you know, sometimes you you put you know you be, you become like your player. You know, you're just you just forget about the other things. You know, sometimes I feel like, and I I mean, obviously I'm no professional athlete, so I, I can't speak to that. But you know, you can tell those guys who generally just care so much about so many different things, family, you know, community, and just other aspects of life, except for just the game. And I feel like that's, you know, that's someone like you and Albert and others. I th I, it's just amazing. Well, at the same time, I feel like that helped his career and his longevity. I mean, you don't play for that many teams with that many people if you're an ass, you know what I'm saying? And, and as bluntly as that is, I mean, a lot of people towards the end of your career, a lot of people aren't going to want to bring you in the clubhouse if you're not going to help be a good presence in the clubhouse, right? And I mean, that's the way I see it. So like you said, as good as the ball player as he is, for him to be an even better person only says how good of a person he actually yeah. is. Yeah. I know of a lot of good players, a lot of good players with a lot of talent that are not in the major leagues and are playing somewhere else. I know. Mm. And for those reasons we said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you don't you don't have to say them. <laughs> no, no. Well, you probably know them. No, no. We can talk. We can mention. We could. We'll be talking all night about. It's yeah. a bunch of them. So the dot the Dodgers. Let's talk about the Dodgers. You guys are seventy five and forty six right now. Um, playing well. I want to get your you know your outlook on this final kind of push towards the back end of the season. And what do you what do you guys think up to this point? Well, man, I, I like our chances. You know, like if we the you know, the season ends today, we're in the playoff. Mm -hmm. Right. And so uh, it doesn't really matter how you go, you get in the playoff. It's just, I mean, we're, I think we're, we're very happy with the way we're playing. It's just that the Giants are playing like they don't right. want to lose, you know. But um, I think we're getting there, you know, we're getting everybody healthy. We had um, a bad year when it comes to injuries. Uh, we had Seager hurt for a long time. Uh, Gavin Locks and, and and Mookie Betts and you oh, know, so a lot of yep. a lot of uh, yeah a lot of injuries uh, Bellinger so well little by little it's just you know I I just think our goal is to have all those pieces healthy uh, for the last month of the last fifteen twenty days right before the playoff and then see what happens you know yeah from there. I wanted to ask you about the new found, well, newly amplified rivalry with the Padres going on this year with Dodgers Padres. And they've brought in some excellent talent this year um, on their pitching staff and in their hitters. And what does that mean for you for the organization to have that inner California rivalry going? Well, I think every, every team that we play against, it's just a, a, a tough opponent you know I, I don't really i don't think i don't see that as a big thing because when you mention like rivalry the the the, the giants is a bigger one you know sure like giants giants dodgers like when we play the giants we really want to beat them you know what right. i mean right we really want to so it's just um so the Padres is just just because they they have a better team this year or better names you know that doesn't really we still play them you know we got to play them but um it's not a big thing. I think the Giants Dodgers is the bigger one. Yeah, they, and again, and again, this is my personal opinion. Of I don't know how we feel in a, in, a, in a clubhouse, but I'm pretty sure we feel like we want to beat. Obviously, we want to beat everybody, but the Giants more than anybody else. Right. The whole state of California is doing very well. Yeah, year, so, yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. Sure, so we, we'll take some over here in Detroit. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll you take a swing some of that talent this way. Yeah, but we're coming up though. We're 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 start. We're trying to get there here in Detroit. You know, we're on the we're on the come up, as people like to say. You know, uh, so we can only hope for better days ahead. Um, but yes, Plaster, I do want to ask you, um, what was it for you that made you? decide that it was over for your career when well, you're still hitting 260 where majority of major leaguers would be clapping their hands at that in the season saying hey i hit 260 in a full season's worth of at bats you know so like what was it for you that said you know what i, I think i'm done it was with the marlins here in miami yeah it was yeah, it was and, uh, yeah, yeah. i'm sorry miami 
and I, and I was and I was um, already like aching a lot of aching in in uh, uh, spending a lot of time in the club in the, in the training room, you know, and just playing maybe two or three times a week, and uh, I wanted to spend time at home. So that's what happened. I'm like, you know what? Maybe this is it for me. Let me try to end on a good note, you know, and and just go home and enjoy family. My my kids, my kids were maybe nine and thirteen at that time, and uh, those are ages that you know, like you don't they don't come back. And uh, I wanted to travel with them and do other stuff. Yeah, you want to be there for them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I know I'm probably biased in this because I watched you play over the years in Detroit, but. I personally think that you were definitely a Hall of Fame worthy and should have been in the Hall of Fame. Um, What are your thoughts on that? You know, like, what are your thoughts on the Hall of Fame in general? And then you, you know, how that matches up with with you and your career, how you finish? Well, I imagine that'd be that'd be an honor if if I'm a Hall of Famer. Remember, because that would be like something crazy. Because I I would I would have that'd be a guy that. Uh, it wasn't so because I remember I, I wasn't a guy with the with the best talents. I wasn't the the burner. I didn't have power. I didn't have none of that. But I did have a big heart that, that and you know I really wanted it. So I I was the type of guy that hustled a lot and all that. Right. So from being a guy that ah uh, maybe he can be a professional, maybe not a guy that signed professional baseball, a guy that made it to the major leagues, a guy that played all-star game, a guy that won gold glove, a guy that won silver slugger and ALCS MVP, and now Hall of Famer, that would be like a really big, big thing, you know? Right. Um, because, I mean, when I was in the Dominican Republic, uh, to be honest, not not a lot of scouts saw me, you know? and, and I mean, I didn't like anybody. Yeah. Oh, nobody, <laughs> you know? I mean, nobody liked me. Because you know they 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 didn't sign me, they didn't say anything to me. But the Japanese team, and uh, and now to maybe be in that conversation, that's yeah, just just a winner for me, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hall of Famer, Hall of Famer. If today you got my vote. Yeah, my vote. You got yeah. mine as well. Yeah, but thank you, thank you very much. But you know what? I I I just got inducted in the Dominican Republic Hall of Fame. Yeah. Congratulations. I, congrats, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Congratulations on that. I mean, you're still finishing with, uh, I think you still hold the record for third base or is it shortstop for the highest per- defensive percentage still? 90. For both. 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 Them, both. You still got them both, right? Ooh. That's yeah. it. That's it. That's, that's, that's the Hall of Fame pitch right there. <laughs> yeah. the middle, the middle infield defender almost ever. I, you could say ever. Wait, let's start a campaign. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's start it right here. Right here. Right here. We start from Detroit. We start from Detroit. Get the plus of the Blanco in the Hall of Fame campaign going right now. Right now. I'm not joking. And we'll have, we got backings. We got backings from players, managers, all that. It's, and you know what? I don't think a lot of people would disagree. Exactly. Thank break. you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. So, uh, but thank you so much uh, for, you know, joining us today and taking the time. It's been a pleasure. It's been, you know, an honor, really. You know, you think about it. There's a couple guys who, like, I, you know, I love, would love to talk to. It's you. Pudge and Maglio, you know, from that 2000, yeah. those back days, you know, those guys were just, you know, fantastic. And you, you as well, fantastic career. Perfect. Well done. And yeah, uh, we can't thank you enough for coming on. Yeah. Oh, that's always my pleasure. Thank you for the interview and stay in touch and good luck with your program. Okay. Thank you, you too, so man. much. Good luck. All in right. Your All right. As well. All right. Chap. All right. All right.